Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name's Louise Corbyn, the Vice Chair of the Tyne Weir branch of the Geographical Association. Welcome to today's talk. Um, just a reminder that everyone's welcome to attend our events, whether you're a GA member or not. Uh, the events are free, but we do welcome donations and also we would encourage you to join the GA. Uh, we're very keen to hear about topics that you would find useful in our lecture series, certainly at the minute. We're looking at um, talks for our ne the next academic year. So please feel free to get in touch. Your contact details are on the slide that you can see. You can contact myself or uh, Brenda, who is the chair, or Amy, our current secretary. Um, if you've got any just ideas of things that you might like to see on our lecture series, that would be uh, interesting to know what people are interested in. I also just remind you as well that the GE does have um, its own geography education online, the GE or website. It's really useful for years 12 and 13 students, um, especially for catching up on material missed during the various lockdowns that we've had. The materials and services are excellent quality and they're cheap out of access if you're a GEA member. Um, from an audience point of view, it's nice for our speakers to have an audience rather than talking as a void of cyberspace. So please keep your camera on if you feel comfortable to. Um, obviously, you're very welcome to do that. If you've got any pet questions, if you could pop those in the chat, and what I'll do is I'll compile um, some, que some que the questions and answers for a session at the end. Um, you could also use the raise hand function um, and you're invited to ask a question to unmute the mic if that's something that you feel comfortable doing. Obviously, please wait just um, for you that to be recognised. So if you're interested in the certificate, we've had lots of people requesting certificates this year. Um, please email myself at louisemarleycorburn at gmail.com. Um, and what I'll do is if you give me your full name, I will get you a certificate for this evening's talk sent out. Um, or you can just let me know via the chat or via that email that is on there. So obviously tonight we have a fabulous talk, which certainly I'm very, very interested in with Dr. Craig Robson, Geospatial Engineering Group at Newcastle University on how can GIS add value to geography teaching. Um, just a little bit of information about Craig and just about the Geospatial Engineering Group. So Craig is part of the Geospatial Engineering Group at Newcastle University, and that's been offering the only undergraduate degree in GIS in the United Kingdom for over 20 years, whilst also delivering a range of CPD and outreach program, programs during this time. The group has built a wealth of experience from working with teachers, including making school visits, giving talks and running short activities, inviting classes to the university for a full day programme of activities around GIS and spatial data, obviously pre-COVID, with a strong history of working with industry partners and a long record of research collaborations. The group is well known um, UK-wide for their leading role in and around GIS, spatial data science and related fields. Through these experiences and work, the group continues to develop activities and grow interactions with schools to increase awareness of GIS and the powerful tool that it can be with a developing set of activities and ideas around how GIS can be used both in the classroom and outside for field work. With this in mind, today's talk then looks at how GIS, Geographic Information Systems, can provide a powerful means to add value to teaching, from highlighting underpinning geographic concepts to provide an interactive platform to engage students. As a growing part of many curriculum, this talk will explore how GIS can be used, providing examples, such as exploring census data um, and the relationships between variables such as deprivation, other census metrics, developed using our own experiences for using GIS across many geographic topics and from working with schools across the UK to develop activities. So without any more ado, I'm going to hand now over to uh, Craig, um, who's going to do this incredibly interesting talk for us today. Thank you very much, Craig, in advance. Thank you for the introduction and afternoon, everyone. I'll just try and share my screen. Um, yep, hopefully you can all see that. Yeah. Yep, brilliant. Uh, yep, so thanks again for the introduction. Um, so just to go over that. Um, I am Craig Robson. I've, I've done a, a degree in GIS um, back in 2008 um, at Newcastle University and I've been there ever since. Um, so during that time I've 
gone to do a PhD and um, since moved into doing a lot of research in the group, um, mostly around spatial data and um, including sort of outreach work as well. Um, so, and um, as Louise said, um, we're part of the geospatial engineering group, so we don't actually sit in geography, we sit in engineering. Um, so a lot of our research and work's actually mainly focused around um, sort of GIS, spatial data, and how that's used in sort of civil engineering and climate change and all those sorts of themes. Um, although we do collaborate jointly with the geography department on a few um, things as well, including helping out with their teaching. Um, so as we said, we've been delivering GIS and sort of land surveying degree for over 20 years now. Um, and we generally get 30 students a year coming through to do under our undergraduate degrees. Um, we also start to offer um, sort of MRes and research degrees as well. Um, obviously during that time, we've done a lot of work with local schools, especially um, to help increase awareness of GIS and how it can be used um, just to support the GIS in teaching and to sort of raise awareness of students when they're thinking about applying for undergraduate degrees. So there isn't just geography, they can also look at GIS and to maybe think about that as an option. Um, so in the past, we have picked up a few students from who've started a geography degree, realized actually they prefer to do a GIS degree, so they've moved over. Um, so as much as about trying to increase awareness generally of um, GIS. Um, so what I'm gonna try and talk about is give a brief introduction to what GIS is. Um, we know from experience from speaking to teachers and um, going to schools and holding some focus groups that a lot of some teachers aren't overly aware of what GIS is or they lack a bit of knowledge to be able to teach that. So I'm going to give a bit of an introduction of what GIS is and um, sort of a few basic concepts. Um, then I'll give a few examples of how we can use GIS. Um, so I'll cover a quick example in census, but I'll give a bit more detail later on. Um, I'll obviously cover COVID because where is a presentation nowadays about covering COVID at some point. Um, and then I'll go through a few sort of um, suggestions and ways in which we think can sort of help to use GIS actually in teaching and in the classroom in a number of ways. And obviously that's potentially a bit more difficult in the COVID world at the moment, but there's obviously a few examples in there that might um, make that more possible and seem a bit easier. Um, and we're trying to keep as much as this sort of free to use software as well. So we're not sort of trying to um, add extra costs, shall we say. Um, so start of what is GIS. Um, we say GIS is just a very complicated sort of quote on screen there, um, a geographic information system, so integrates hardware, software, and data um, for capturing, analyzing, and displaying spatial data. Obviously that's quite long-winded, um, but essentially GIS is a way of um, sort of storing and actually visualizing data. Um, and I'm sure most of you are probably aware of that and have used GIS to some extent from Google Earth to actually sort of desktop software such as ArcGIS. Um, so probably don't need to go over that. And as I said, we teach a degree in GIS um, and we see GIS as a much bigger concept rather than just the software that you might interact with and use. Um, so GIS from a teaching perspective, from our perspective anyway, is a lot bigger. Um, so start off with uh, how we actually collect the data. So um, using satellite imagery, GPS, um, drones, the modern technology, how we actually capture that data and then how we can store that as well. Um, so how we store it in maybe in files or sort of databases, so bringing in a bit of IT there, um, how we can actually visualize that data. Um, so, and whether that's statistical analysis as well. Um, so I like to think the GIS is a way of bringing together lots of different subject areas as well. Um, so it's not just something that maybe fits in geography, but could also bring in maths and other sciences as well. Um, yeah, and as I say, there's lots of GIS software. So obviously we can use GIS on the computer, we can use it on phones. So, you know, Google Maps is the uh, simple example of a simple GIS. Um, and obviously then there's also this up here, it's the people GIS covers a lot of areas. Um, 
So you might use it in geography, but um, most companies have a GIS department from civil engineering companies to your supermarkets. Um, they all use GIS for planning where to build the next supermarket, for analyzing how customers shop. So do club card holders for Tesco go to their local shop or they'd actually go one bit further away because it's got a bigger selection of uh, products. Um, GIS is used in all sorts of ways um, and we can sort of begin to sort of explore that as well. Um, so GIS helps us to ask and answer questions about spatial data. Um, it allows us to solve problems um, from, helps to solve problems from like climate change, understand what processes may lead to certain spatial patterns. Um, so we can think about, so for example, so about earthquakes, we can map the location of earthquakes to the, um, and we can quickly identify from that where the plate boundaries are, where you're more likely to see volcanic eruptions, where you might see more disruption from um, events. Um, you tend to see a lot of GIS presentations. If you see them, most of them might introduce GIS originating from Jon Snow, uh, cholera map back in, I can't remember when it is now, um, but his, his first, his first use of GIS was to plot the occurrences of um, cholera in London. And um, if you look at a map around here, you've got X marks the spots where the water pumps were. And you can see obviously there's a lot of um, cases of cholera around the area. If we were to take that from John Snow's original hand-drawn map and turn it into something like more like a map of nutritional today, this is what it would look like with the red dots showing the um, number of cases per address. Um, and this gives a nice little example of actually the origins of GIS. Um, and as I say, GIS is about taking what could be a CSV or a spreadsheet and actually mapping it and what given adding that extra value to that data set. So in this case, this is census data um, for Newcastle, which you're probably quite familiar with. Um, and we're simply taking the codes associated with the areas and mapping them to see the patterns of data. Um, and I'll explore a lot more about how we do that in census data later on. Um, we'll give a few examples and potentially some live demos if we have time. Um, so as I've covered, GIS is a way of answering questions where we can identify patterns that are inherently spatial, um, sort of bring spatial data to life. Um, so if you look at a data on a spreadsheet, we can't see what points, how, how are they located, are they next to each other, are they 10 miles away? Um, being able to map that and basically see that obviously allows you to gain a lot more from that data. Um, and that's essentially what GIS is about. And it's obviously applicable to lots of aspects of the geography curriculum, but as I said earlier, we think you can also bring in um, aspects to other areas of teaching as well. So I'm going to do now is give a few examples of um, how we can use GIS in different ways um, to look at different themes. Um, so I've got three sets of examples here, which we'll cover, and then we'll move on to actually some um, how we can actually use GIS and think, and think how it can be used in the classroom a bit more. Um, so this first example is around air quality. Um, so for those of you are familiar with the Urban Observatory, or those not familiar with the Urban Observatory, I should say, um, the Urban Observatory is this uh, group run by the Newcastle University, um, and it's the largest source of free open data um, for cities and urban areas in the UK. Um, so it has millions and millions of data points. Um, so we've got sensors around the city collecting things from air pollution to rainfall to noise pollution. Um, the Germans actually have worked with some schools, so some of you on the, on the on what listening in may have uh, already worked with the Germans actually know a bit about it. Um, but basically, it, it gives us a lot of city level data, which we wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, so what we can start to look, we can start to use this data to look at um, patterns that we wouldn't be otherwise be able to see. So, um, for example, the government have a network of 160 centres across the UK measuring air pollution, but through the urban observatory, we have that at a much coarser scale. So 
Um, so rather than just having two government sensors, we actually have over 100 of our own sensors to allow us to look at that data in a lot more details and see, try and understand what causes air pollution, how air pollution changes over time. Um, you know, from per day, does it change at weekends? Um, so there's lots of stuff we can look at with this extra information. Um, so here is an example of some data from the urban observatory, which we've mapped. So down here, we've got all the sensors that the observatory have in the city center. Um, as I say, this is all free to access. Um, I haven't put uh, URLs down here. Um, so if we map the location of those sensors, we can start to look at um, the concentrations of this PM 2.5, um, the average concentration over the course of a day. This is um, in this map here um, at various locations. You can see that some of the locations around the central motorway, the Tyne Bridge, um, and busy roads such as Gillingham Road and the um, Gosford High Street have high levels of pollution, but those less urban areas, less busy areas around Fenham, within the housing areas tend to have less um, levels. And that's something that you won't be able to infer if you just saw a spreadsheet of data or um, some other sort of source. So this is what we mean by being able to actually pick out more information from this data. Um, and obviously I've focused on PM 2.5 there, but there are a lot of other data associated that don't carbon dioxide, um, PM 10 and other uh, pollutants. Um, I said we can look at how it varies over time. So this is a graph here of the Tyne Bridge sensor, the gateshead side of the river. Um, and this shows how the PM 2.5 actually varies throughout the day. Um, you can start to see a sort of, you know, as traffic increases, the rate of PM 2.5 increases. Um, and that sort of helps to explain not just how it varies with space, you're having very temporary as well. Um, and I'm sure there's other examples that we could pull out that give this sort of output, whether it's pollution or um, traffic counts. So if you're um, as a result of COVID, we introduced some tra uh, people counters around the Fumbling Street so we could track the number of people using city centre. Um, and there was a whole sort of web page for that as well. So there's another data set which is free to access for people to download as well. So you can track how footfall and traffic changes as the COVID regulations change, for example. Um, as we're looking at census data, um, so this is a very quick example of census data. An example here is on London. Later on, I'll give an example that actually looks at um, Newcastle and Tyne and Weir. Um, so this obviously is census data for 2011. Um, so this is looking at the population around London and in this particular case, the percentage of the population for each zone, which works in finance, so which we work in banking basically. Um, and this allows us to understand sort of where people live and work. So if these people are working in finance, they're probably commuting to the center of London. Um, so how do they get there? Um, the next slide will give a hint to that. Um, and we can look at if all these people are living in these areas, um, why aren't they living in the city centre? What sort of access do they have to other facilities? Um, things like that. So if we go into the next slide, we can see the uh, percentage of people actually commuting via public transport. Um, so you can see in the centre of London, um, very few people say they're commuting via public transport. Um, again, we could drill down and look at the percentage of people really commuting using bikes or walking um, to understand, you know, you know where, where's, where's best to invest in more public transport or better cycle in provision or facilities that facilitate um, sort of more active travel and people um, rather than using driving or um, using public transport, which obviously in the COVID world is potentially um, an extra risk is the ways we can actually um, plot that. and. Yeah, if, if, I, if we overlaid the tube network on this, you'd probably see that there's quite a large number of tube stations around this ring here, then as we further out, they become more dispersed. Um, so I'll leave the census there um, and we'll come back to census in time away later on. Um, as I said, I'll give an example of COVID. Um, so obviously, COVID is a, obviously 
everyone knows COVID started and we map, we can map that to very mappable um, data available. Um, so this this has been mapped on ArcGIS Online. So some of you may know about ArcGIS Online, some of you may have used it, but this dashboard is um, the tool that was made available. Um, and they've mapped the cases of COVID around the world as it spread. Um, so this was work done by John Hopkins University in America. Um, in this web page itself, this dashboard is one of the most visited sites in the U, um, in the world in 2020. Um, so it shows you how active and how interested people were in actually looking at the spread spatially of COVID. Um, so it's an interactive dashboard. We can explore the data. We can um, look at how it's mapped. Um, I should add that the maps shown here, this map, we could generate this from a CSV file. Um, so it is easy to map this data and I'll cover in short um, how we can sort of do that. Um, so we can explore this data set. We can delve in to look at how it potentially spread. Um, so the bottom there, you can see the timeline of um, cases um, plotted. Obviously these screenshots are a few months old. Um, all well, year old now, but yeah, this, this, this dashboard is live and I can show an example later of it. Um, bringing it to the UK, um, also UK government have made maps and graphs and all sorts to look at the um, COVID over the UK. Um, so this is a simple example of um, a simple map at the uh, census zone level, middle layer, super output level for the census, um, looking at uh, deaths in Mar from March 2020 to January 21. Um, and although this plot shows the number of deaths, um, it's not, the data isn't normalized. So um, this might be a case for the bad, it's not a best example of a map. So the proportional symbols, obviously scales and number of deaths per area, but they don't actually relate to actual underlying population of the area. Um, so it's just a potential there that, you know, we can make data show what we want to show um, in GIS. We can tell a story with it, but we can also potentially, um, yeah, let data tell the story that um, we want to show. Um, it's not, there's ways and means of, visualizing the data which can uh, mislead. Um, so what might be a better example here is actually a chloroplast map, a colored map, um, such as I showed for the census data a few slides ago where each area is colored, so the symbols don't overlap and we can normalize it based on the population. Um, and GIS and maps aren't all about um, data at a single time step. Um, so this is a uh, map of a couple of diseases and how the diseases from spread from our origins around the globe. Um, so in a similar way to COVID did. Um, so you can see here the origin of leprosy um, and then how it spread around the globe or how it's sort of fought to spread around the globe and the same for smallpox from here. Um, obviously this, this map, it shows the spatial patterns of how the disease spread and how it was so the path around the globe, but it doesn't actually show the time scales of that. Um, the time scales are written in text. So GIS can also be um, sort of like a way of telling a story in itself, and we can create temporal maps and videos from that um, to show how disease is spread or um, other processes occur. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to leave it there for those examples. Um, I'm going to put this slide in about tools just as a summary. I imagine most of you have probably heard of quite a few of these or um, used them. Um, so Google Earth and Google Maps and Excel are probably the standard ones which people are most familiar with. Um, obviously ArcGIS Online um, is becoming increasingly popular and um, has a wealth of tools and resources which we'll cover. Um, in the second half of the presentation. Um, then there's the desktop software. Um, some of you might have heard of ArcGIS and be familiar with it. Um, Quantum GIS is another one, which is free. Um, so it's not licensed like ArcGIS, so you can use it for free. Um, and it works similarly in that you can 
make maps and there's no extra cost associated with that. Obviously, ArcGIS Online, the resources are free, but if you want to create your own maps and things, you need to log in and dissociate it um, using your own passwords and things like that. Um, so, GIS in the classroom. I, we as a group have been doing outreach for a number of years um, and we've been going into schools, as Louis said in the introduction, to um, you know, deliver GIS talks, be that an hour long talk on GIS and or doing an exercise on top of that as well. So introducing um, students to um, how you can use GIS and things like mapping earthquakes and hazards or um, other geographic processes. Um, so as a group, we've, we've developed a set of, set of exercises um, to try and make GIS easier to engage with. Um, and that sort of will cover some of that. And we're, we're this is an evolving process, so we're still in this process of doing this. So we're actually looking to develop more exercises as well on top of what we've currently got. Um, I should also, yeah. Um, so, for those who haven't heard, used ArcGIS Line or come across it, um, I'm hoping quite a few of you have heard of ArcGIS Line. Um, it's web-based GIS. Um, it's a suite of tools um, and data, including free data and various web applications. Um, so it allows us to create maps. It also allows us to share maps and make them publicly available. So. Um, there's lots of maps already out there that people can use and you don't need to log in. You just have to find the map and then you can use it. Um, so this is how we do a lot of our exercises that we develop. We, we use our logins to create the map, and use our knowledge to create that map, and then we can make that publicly available and anyone in the world can use that map to, for their purposes, be that for teaching or other. Um, and it's a good way of being able to share the resources and our knowledge and be able to um, help people introduce JS into the classroom. Um, as I say, we're developing free, um, free exercises and resources. Um, obviously, I know we're not the only ones doing this. There's a lot of resources out there, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but as a local group, we're happy to help out and run workshops and do school visits and things like that. Um, ArcGIS isn't about making necessarily all about making maps. As I said, it's got a lot of free data sets. Um, so, for example, there's a bit called Living Atlas on Arc and ArcGIS Online, which has hundreds and thousands of data sets, which you can all just, you can just, you just drag and drop into your map and it'll draw them on the app. Um, you can search for them and they're all free to access. Um, so, yeah, for example, we've got some census data. Um, but also there's lots of other different layers. So we can just simply drag and drop uh, the um, occupation layer onto the map and we've instantly got a chloroplex map of occupation. And we can zoom into that to see a much um, closer scale. Um, so we can zoom in to have a look at subscale and so look at the patterns, how it varies per location. Um, we can also add other layers. So for example, um, we can add green space layers that's freely available um, and look how that might relate to the data. And we can also add other data sets. So this was looking at um, the actual average construction age of buildings in an area. Um, and there's a whole host of data sets, such as obviously like a couple of examples. Um, all this data is free and um, it's published by a whole range of users. Um, so um, as you make it available, so there's data obviously from national statistics and other providers. Um, and it's not just UK, it's global. Um, so you can pull in data to exemplify um, rainforest loss, for example, in the Amazon or um, desertification from the Sahara Desert and things like that. Um, we can, data is available for most of these things. It's just finding it and adding it to a map. Um, when we were speaking to uh, teachers over the past few years, one of the things that came up was um, the need to be able to do field work and for students to be able to go and do that field work themselves, um, trying to make that easier. Um, so obviously some of the ways people said to did it was, you know, you could use um, collect data via postcode or coordinate and we're gonna, how do you actually map that onto a map? Um, 
So one of the things we can do is you can import that data into um, a GIS software um, and we can map that straight away. And this is one of the sort of things, exercise we want to um, make available and to show how you can do it. Um, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, so for example, we've spoke to teachers who uh, get a student send the data into Excel and then they can map that in Google Earth. And this is a similar process. Um, yeah, so this is getting quad, getting um, postcode data um, and then using online resources website to just convert that postcode into a coordinate and then we can map that straight on the map without having to um, do any further work to the data. Um, and that's quite a quick and easy process and we can sort of, yeah. Um, one of the resources that we do offer and one of the exercises we do have is um, actually completely digitizing that process. So um, with ArcGIS Online, there's a web app called Survey123, which allows you to um, do it all on mobile phones, essentially. Um, so students can download the app onto their phone, go collect their data, um, and then it's instantly added to ArcGIS Online. So you can map that data straight away. Um, so there's a little bit of setup involved, um, but it is, a free resource that you can use. Um, so you can first design a custom survey. So um, as the sort of teacher or the group leader, um, you can design a survey, which is simple drag and drop boxes um, to create this survey, like you're just doing like a Google form, for example. Um, and then within that, you can record, give the option to record the location. Um, so what we've done in the past, we've done a few cases um, where we had schools in, we send them out to collect data, either, so for example, on the Fumbling Street, the type of shops, or from a local park. Um, so I can show an example of that. Um, let's see if here yeah, we'll try and... Um, do, 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 um, Let's just switch the screen I'm sharing. Um, so here's a quick example from survey one, two, three. So as I said, it's a drag and drop thing. So we can just add a number in there and have a question and that instantly becomes an input for users for the survey. So on their phone, that's then a question they can answer. Um, so as I said, we've had schools in and students in to um, sort of do surveys. So this is a survey on the Fumbling Street um, within an hour. I had a class of 30, 30 school kids who went down the Fumbling Street and around Ellen Square, collected data. Um, and this is showing the um, chain shops, independent shops, and um, ones that have been classified as both. Um, so instantly you start to look at the patterns of sort of occurring. As I say, as the students collected data, this data can be in real time. So in an hour, we've covered an area. And we've done this for other places. We've also done this for. Um, Leaders Park. So send the students out into the park to collect some collect some data on the health of plants and then we can map this so um, we can see the distribution of plants and trees for example throughout the park. As you zoom in and out we can um, the graphs updates. This is um, all using ArcGIS online so um, it's very free for you to access um, and we have exercises as I say which we can share and distribute around doing this. Um, let's go back to PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, yeah. So hope you can see um, how we actually, once you've collected the data, we have lots of analysis options. Um, in ArcGIS, we have a lot of tools to do that. Um, so be visual interpretation, um, plot and correlate maps or sort of looking at hotspots of data. So this is looking, this here is looking at hotspots of earthquakes. Um, so it's free to access data and we can look at, um, this is hotspots. So as you expect, there's a hotspot around Greece, um, another one here and more on the, on the Pacific ring um, around Indonesia. And all this can be done in ArcGIS for free. Um, and we have, again, we have an exercise which does this. Um, we can be made available.
Um, so carrying on the theme along ArcGIS, so hopefully some of you are aware of story maps and how you can use story maps to tell a story um, and incorporate lots of maps and videos and other media. Um, so these are produced and then again put online for free so we can access all these for free. Um, hopefully it's a way of you being able to introduce GIS without actually having to do any work really um, once you've found the resources. Um, so we can um, jump to some examples of story maps. It's best to be explained through that. Um, where, do, 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 do. Um, let me find the screen to share. Share this one. Um, so this is something called Living Atlas, and this is what's called Indicators of a Planet, and it's all free. This is free. Um, for example, if we go look at deforestation um, gives a nice example of deforestation um, and then there's a map here which shows the rate of deforestation um, various places but at the bottom here we've got um, links to other resources linked to deforestation this includes sort of a story map of um, deforestation so it tells a story about tree loss and Deforestation introduces um, various locations um, and then eventually gets down to um, actually why it's important. So there's a nice little video of trees here. And disease, these sorts of story maps are free for lots of things. So um, like there's one on COVID, there's one lot, lots of different earth processes which um, might be appropriate. And so these are all um, there as there and can access these for free. Um, that's that one. I did have another one. Um, let's bring that up. Um, um, so this is one for the Thames. Um, so this is a story up on this. So it was a story of the Thames from the mouth. So. Um, about how the Thames has been cleaned up since the 1950s um, and how it's changed ecologically and how um, developments along the Thames have changed it, um, how it's been turned from this dirty industrial river to something that's much more cleaner and um, much more environmentally friendly and home to a lot of more um, habitats and wildlife. Um, so it's quite useful resources and obviously, as I said, there's lots of ways to um, interact and search for these. Um, so if we go back to, um, yeah, so this is all I've just covered. Um, this is a whole, like I say, it's a whole platform of different, covering different um, geographic processes. You can see El Nino down at the bottom there, um, ocean health and all those sorts of um, topics. And as I say, for each of them, there's a set of story maps and um, resources which are available. Um, so it could be something to go through in the classroom or to um, send students away to look at. Um, so this example is just from the earthquakes topic um, where a nice map of um, where earthquakes are occurring um, and this sort of data is real time as well, it's not static. So every time they go back, they'll see a different map, for example. Um, so given it is a, uh, census day on the 21st of March later this month. Um, I thought I'd throw in a bit of more detailed example of using census data um, and different resources around um, be able to show and highlight census and the human data around that. Um, so I suspect a lot of you have heard of DataShine, um, which is this open website where you can go to and look at the data and look at different parameters um, and makes a nice sort of map shall we say. Um, obviously the data comes from the Office of National Statistics, so we can also go to the NOMIS website um, to look at the data and download the actual raw data as well. Um, if you want to get into some detailed statistics around the data. And then as I mentioned earlier, actually a lot of the census data is actually available in ArcGIS Online for free, already mapped and plotted. Um, so you just need to add it to the map and it'll produce a map without you know one click of the button um, so you don't need to do any data manipulation you don't need to join data sets together um data is there 
And once it's in ArcGIS online, obviously it adds bonus areas and add other data, data sets. Um, unlike data shine, data shine just for the census data, so you can't add um, other data sets around land use or other um, auxiliary data. Um, so data shine does allow you to look at the data, you can download it. Um, as I say, download the CSV, then you need to get um, other data sets to actually be able to map that and allow students to interact and um, look at that. Um, the website itself is quite good, um, I think. Um, but as I say, you can't add contextual data to, um, to student census data, so you couldn't add add in sort of where the green space is, um, you know, what crime rates like in the area. We can't add in that in. Um, whereas if you use something like ArcGIS Online or other GIS software, we're able to add that data in. Um, so I said NOMIS is where the data comes from. Um, it's the, from the census providers, ONS, um, and allows us to download a CSV of data, um, but it's not very easy to use if you've tried to use it. Um, so this is looking at the key tables that you can access, so looking at population and age and um, ethnicity and characteristics such as that. Um, if you want to download the population data, go, go through a whole set of steps to get to the data, to select the area we want, to actually select the data we want. Um, this is just selecting data for time away for free areas. Um, then we can produce a map, um, which gives you something like this for those free areas. Um, and again, it's the same issue as that gives you the data for the area, but you can't add any other information in. Um, but we can also download data and we can do a few more advanced queries with it. Uh, ArcGIS Online, um, which is where I'll give a bit more detailed example of. Um, this is, um, I'd say it's data is already in GIS and it's free to use. So um, you can build them out quite quickly. Um, and there's lots of analysis options around how we can use that data. Um, so this is where I'm going to try and jump to. Um, a live demo of some things I've prepared um, to actually show how we can interact with the census data in ArcGIS Online. Um, so let's pull up, um, to pull up the right web page and help. Um, so this is um, the Arc Map um, web interface. So here we can see um, we've got. This is deprivation data on the map. Um, so this is from 2015. Um, we can see how deprivation levels vary across Newcastle, and this covers the whole UK. Um, so literally to add that to the map, um, literally just add in deprivation, uh, search for that, and literally just drag and drop, well, add to map, and it adds that layer to the map. There's no data manipulation and it brings it up in that um, same sim symbology. Um, I'll just turn that off, keep the original one on. Um, and I'll say we can add other data in. So here I've got um, qualifications, that's all I want. Um, obviously, when you overlay that data, um, it's difficult to compare and see how the qualifications actually match up with deprivation is there a relationship there between the two data sets um you can't it's difficult to tell that um what the story might be there around that um so if we what i've prepared hopefully if this works is um a swipe map which is again is free to access so um on the left you've got the deprivation data and on the right we've got the qualification data um so now we can actually Start to try and uh, ident identify and compare um, different zones to look at the deprivation and the relationship between deprivation and qualifications. So, um, for example, if I click on this zone here, um, brings up the deprivation data. If I was to swipe over it, that pop up changes to qualification data, and I can look at data qualifications, percentage population with no qualifications, percentage unemployed, for example. And this is how we compare um, census data with each other. Um, I was looking at different metrics. Now, I'd say we can add contextual information to that as well. Um, so, for example, if I go to this page, this map, um, again, I've got occupation data shown, um, but then I can add, um, okay, we can add something like 
green space for that. Um, obviously, there's quite a, quite a relationship between green space and health and well-being. Um, so we can add that to the map. So this is, again, national coverage. Um, this layer, for some reason, defaults to London. So it takes it to London. But if I search up here for Newcastle, um, it'll take me to Newcastle. Um, this is why you shouldn't type in real time in a live demo. Um, so Chicks, you jumped into Newcastle. Um, and then we can see a green space. Now, obviously, not all green space is actually accessible. Um, so what we could do is we could also filter that green space. Um, so if you look at function, um, so automatic populate, so where the function is public park or garden. Um, and then we're left with just those spaces, which in theory are parks and gardens that people can actually access um, rather than golf courses and other places which are privately accessed. Um, obviously, there's a whole load of data sets we can add into that um, to add the stand to the story and to add to how we can explain the relationship between the data and um, how neighbourhoods change. So a good example from here is on this boundary here, we've got a nice, um, we've got an area which seemingly isn't deprived and then next door to it, we've got an area which is deprived. Um, so it's an easy way of being able to sort of uh, try and identify these patterns and understand them. And I'd say in JS, there's a lot more analysis we can do to so kind of identify these areas through statistical methods. Um, obviously not going to cover that today. Um, so we'll leave that there as a live example. Um, to go back to the slides. Um, yeah, so as I said, um, we, I'm going to leave that there for examples of GIS. Um, obviously, you know, for the rest of the time, more than happy to have questions and discussions around GIS and how we can use that. Um, this slide um, is about that we, we as a group obviously do outreach, um, and this group is funded. Geospace UK is a new, newish group which is funded um, by. Quite a few businesses who are interested in GIS. Um, so that's why I acknowledge that there's a skill shortage in GIS. Um, you know, it's got one of the latest government reports a few years ago mentioned that in the Geospatial Commission there's a shortage of GIS and spatial knowledge. Um, so this group has been set up and funded by various businesses to be able to encourage um, GIS and spatial um, things in education. Um, so they're funding us and um, an outreach officer um, who I believe is on the call today um, in the meeting to, um, to help develop a new update, a new set of exercises, um, be a new web page with new resources as well. Um, the idea is to try and bring in as many different people as we can and different resources into that. Um, so try and open it up so other people can, everything's one place rather than having multiple different um, sets across different websites. Um, so I said, a new web page, and we are developing set of exercises. I'm more than happy to have a discussion around what exercises are good and what people would think would help in your curriculum as well. Um, in terms of what areas do you think GIS might be useful for? Um, as I say, we've we've got resources to develop these exercises um, in the next six to twelve months. So we're more than happy to take suggestions and ideas. Um, as I said, we also do school visits. Um, I think we're hoping to start that sometime soon. Um, and we're also happy to either come into schools or schools come to us. Um, but we can offer various resources for that. Um, and then also we, we do offer the GIS for Teachers course. So we offer a free one day course in or two afternoon long course on actually engaging with GIS and doing actually some of these exercises um, to make them, I don't know, seem more approachable and um, potentially more applicable to the classroom environment. Um, so I'm going to end it there, um, 10 minutes short of the hour. Um, so yeah, we think JS is quite useful, really useful, and it can help to curriculum. And, um, it's a good way of bringing in other things that aren't just geography as well, so bringing in other ideas as geography. Um, you know, we can look at statistics around data, we can look at um, other processes as well. Um, and there's a lot, there is loads of resources available. I know I haven't haven't touched on any other resources such as the GA offer or RGS offer. Um, but obviously they do offer an awful lot of resources as well. Um, but we, as a local sort of 
um, institution are more than happy to actually interact at a personal level as well and one-on-one -on -one level if required to um, help encourage and fix issues and things like that. Um, a lot of data is free um, and so um, it's not always easy to access or to use um, as I've covered um, yeah and RGS online don't be put off by it it's a big thing but um, it is actually quite easy to use um, once you get started um, yeah and I think that's all I had to say um, so thank you for listening if you've got any questions or any thoughts um, more than happily to listen and try and answer those Uh, thanks. <laughs> Apologies. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, if anyone's got any questions, if you could put them in the chat, that would be great. We've got a question from. Have a look. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, Alex, are your lesson exercises available online? Um, at the moment, they are not. But we, um, so as I said, we're still the, we're developing. Um, so we've got three we're developing, one around earthquakes, one around coastal erosion, and um, a third one around wildfires, um, which is focused on the US. But we're still, those three are sort of at a point where we, we could share them, um, potentially. Um, they haven't been used by any other schools yet. Um, so we've got a focus group of, sort of five or six teachers which we're um, working with, which we plan to send these exercises to in the next week or two. Um, but beyond that, they should be open in the next yeah, the next month or two. Great. I think that links actually to the next question. So that says, who was the best person to contact about accessing some of the activities that you mentioned to schools? Um, who's the best person? Very good question. Um, I guess I can I can field questions and yeah, um, contacts at the first point. Alex, who's on the calls, our outreach officer. Um, so either either of us will probably be a good contact. Um, I think Alex has put an email address in the chat, um, so you can contact her um, if you want, or you can also contact me as well. Um, I'll, put my, I'll put my email address in the chat, and then you can um, approach either of us, and we should be able to get something to you. Great. I mean, from my point of view, I, I was quite excited actually to, to know that I was actually teaching GIS. There was like things you were showing me there that I was thinking, oh, well, I do that and I use that. But actually, I don't think we're highlighting that that's what it is. I think that's probably the next stage that people are doing it, but aren't realising that they're doing, they're using GIS. So that's probably a good, <clears throat> certainly from my point of view, to introduce it as that. Um, there's a question here, let's have a look. Is there any chance all, oh, so is there any chance all I could join the trial group for the tectonics related activity? I'm completing my final PGDE assignment and the topic is introducing GIS to the curriculum. Uh, yeah, um, send me an email and I'll, um, yeah, be more so than happy to. From Alex um, Carter. Um, Okay, yeah, I can, um, yeah, I'll put my email in then if Alex wants to get in touch with me, I can send what we've got thus far. That's all right, Alex. Sorry, I hope you don't mind me unmuting. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again very much, and this has been really uh, interesting. Um, I think it's really great to see the uh, lesson-related activities you're creating because um, as I've gone through my research for this project, the issue I've run up against isn't the lack of stuff that's out there, it's actually almost too much as a teacher to sit there and try and figure out, okay, what here is actually relevant and doable in a class time. So if there was something where you could go and, oh, look, here's an actual 30 to 40 minute session on a specific topic yeah. that you can sit down and get nailed in a class time, that is exactly what uh, would be extremely useful. And I think that also addresses the massive hurdle of all the teachers who don't want to sit down and spend a weekend playing around on ArcGIS. If they've got something that they can just do in a lesson, that's, I think, going to have an impact. Um, so that's really uh, been fantastic to see. And thank you again for all the information. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's great to hear. Because, uh, um, we are, yeah, our effort is focused on developing this set of sort of literally classroom, you know, 35, 45 minute long exercises that are 
free and open to for people to use. Um, so yeah, that sounds great. Um, and I say we've we've developed three or four, but we've still got um, still got the resource to develop another four, five, six potentially exercises. Um, we were, at the moment, I'm going to need focus on sensors, but we've got someone who's starting to work on developing two or three. That literally focus around sensors there. Um, but now we've got a bit more resource on the other side as well. There's another question here. Um, have you got any recommendations about how to find reli reliable data sets on ArcGIS? Because there are just so many and it can be overwhelming. Um, good question. Um, I guess there's no um, there's no easy way. <laughs> uh, a lot of them are provided quite a lot provided by Esri themselves and they sort of make available. Um, but you are right that there's a lot of um, data sets on there that are quite difficult or old um, and out of date. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think there's a single best way that I can recommend of trying to actually sort of narrow down um, the best data sets other than so then looking for those provided by the likes of ONS or Esri or other sort of known organisations, I think. Great. Right, has anyone got any more questions? I think certainly, Craig, just the fact that if we can email yourself and Alex and hopefully if there's the opportunity to get yourselves into school as well to just, you know, help staff with where to start and obviously get students engaged, I think it's brilliant. And just actually the careers opportunities that are available for students, I think, you know, it's, I think in the last year or so, we've kind of, students particularly, have got a lot more tech savvy. So mm. I think this is a really good opportunity for us to kind of bring a bit more technology into the classroom actually and do some of this stuff. So, sorry, go on, Craig. <clears throat> I know it's all right, it's fine. Um, yeah, I've, it's students pick it up a lot quicker. <laughs> we always find that some students tend to pick it up really, really quickly. And yeah, before you know it, they're more they're, they're able to just they're a lot more tend to be quite confident, so they just go ahead and play with things, and then yeah, they'll um, find ways of doing things that we haven't. So we're always happy to like yeah, go to schools and I'd say we've, obviously with COVID, we've not been able to do that over the past year. Um, but always happy to set up and it's not yeah there's a whole sort of obviously most of the staff in the group were happy to go to schools um so um tends to it might not be me it might not be Alex it might be someone else but there's always like staff that teach GIS or work in the area will um yeah happy to make school visits and things yeah. well thank you thank you very much apologies because my voice is going here <laughs> Um, <clears throat> thank you very much and obviously there's been some really positive feedback in the chat as well so um, thanks very much and obviously hopefully everyone's got contact details to get in touch with Craig and Alex so they can get in touch directly. Um, just before we go then, as a reminder about if you would like a certificate then please email myself on louisemarleycoburn at gmail.com if you'd like a certificate just send your name and I'll get that sorted. Um, we have our last two talks in this series um, for this academic year. Um, we've got so far, we've got on Monday, 15th of March, we've got Glyn Roberts, who's doing a talk about Manchester, has regeneration created a sustainable city? Which would be really good, obviously, linking in with A-level case studies, for example, about changing places and sustainability. And Monday, 22nd of March, John Smith is running his second NEA session of the year, um, which obviously looks at the project the students are doing and will be doing as they move into year 13 which would be excellent for students obviously related to that and um, if anyone's interested in obviously making a donation if you get in touch with myself or amy then obviously please do um that's obviously it you know donations are very welcome so thank you very much everybody and we hope to see you at if you would like to get in touch about information for any of the future talks or suggested ideas for any talks for next year then please get in touch on the email addresses that are there. But thank you very much again, Craig, and thanks, Alex, for putting your details on there as well. That's great.